Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Forgive us the power of your Holy Spirit, or give us the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with the power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Oh God, rich in mercy, by the humiliation of your Son, you lifted up this fallen world and rescued us from the hopelessness of death. Lead us into your light that all our deeds may reflect your love through Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading this morning comes from Numbers chapter 21. From Mount Hor, the Israelites sent out by the way to, to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, but the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people and they bit the people so that many Israelites died. 
The people came to Moses and said, we have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people and the Lord said to Moses, make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it on a pole. And whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The Psalm for today is selected verses from Psalm 107. Give thanks to the Lord for the Lord is good for God's mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord proclaim that God redeemed them from the hand of the foe, gathering them in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some were fools and took rebellious paths. Through their sins, they were afflicted. They loathed all manner of food and drew near to death's door. Then in their trouble, they cried to the Lord, and you delivered them from their distress. You set forth your word and healed them and rescued them from the grave. Let them give thanks to you, Lord, for your steadfast love and your wonderful works for all people. Let them offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and tell of your deeds with shouts of joy. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Our gospel today comes from John chapter 3, starting with verse 14. Jesus said, Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light, and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. And let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts be acceptable before you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Trust. Such a big word, isn't it? Trust. In my camp counselor days, I always dreaded the training day when our camp director would take us to the deep woods to do these things called trust falls. The process goes something like this. They divide the whole group into partners and one person stands in front of the other. The person in the front 
is instructed to cross their arms in front of their chest and tell the person behind them falling. The person behind them is instructed to have a position, stand in a way that they can catch the person. And when they're ready, they say, fall on. And it only works if the person in the front is as stiff as a board and they trust the person behind them to catch them. These trust exercises get more daring and dangerous with each step. You can be asked to fall face first to the person catching you. You can also fall in a circle and lots of people are instructed to pay attention and catch you. And then the most trusting exercise is to fall from a platform and fall into this group of people. Now I've seen these trust exercises go terribly sideways where the person falling doesn't stay stiff, does not trust that they will be caught and then they are dropped, sometimes even injured. I've also seen them go really beautifully and you can leave that whole experience feeling really empowered and connected, but they are not comfortable. It's very vulnerable to place your body in the hands of others. And there's a part of me that always remains skeptical of the whole thing, probably because trust does not come easy for this pastor. So I really resonate with the Israelites today. From this place of deep oppression, they have placed their bodies, their whole lives into the hands of this invisible God, leaving everything behind. They're led way out into the wilderness. But camping is only fun for so long, right? After a while, the beautiful landscape grows a little less stunning and they start to long for what they used to have. Even with Pharaoh, even in slavery, they had a place to live. They had a well to gather water from and dependable food sources and a comfortable place to lay their head at night. The longer they are out in the wilderness, the less real the plan seems to be. It's really hard to believe and trust in something that you can't see. So they tell Moses, you have brought us out here to die and we are miserable. And in a way, their worst nightmare becomes true because then they do begin to die. And what a horrible way to go. Death by snakes. You know, the image of a snake should perk up our ears a little bit. Remember when another snake shows up in scripture? Way back at the beginning of Genesis, where a snake convinces Eve that she can attain the knowledge of God. Essentially, she doesn't need to trust God anymore. Why trust God when you can have it all on your own? Yeah, that doesn't go so well for Adam and Eve either, does it? Anyway, we get this weird story in Numbers because it gets even stranger next. God tells Moses to take the image of a snake, their worst nightmare, come to life and put it on a bronze pole. And when the people look at it, stare long and hard into the very thing that is killing them, they are healed. Weird. This seems so counter to what I would do. I mean, I would rather hide the snakes, run away from the snakes, move to a different campground, all sorts of things, as long as I don't have to be around them anymore. Similarly, in our gospel story for today, Jesus names the same thing for Nicodemus. We get this little snippet of a longer conversation. Nicodemus was a Jewish teacher who comes to Jesus in the middle of the night, wondering if he can really trust all that he's doing. Jesus just called the, caused that big ruckus in the temple, overturning the tables and chasing out the marketplace, proclaiming that God has shown up in their midst through him. But could this all really be true? So Jesus and Nicodemus are having this midnight conversation. And we get this text that is almost too familiar and quotable. For God to love the world that God gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. But this is not where Jesus stops. Even though that's the part we all know. He keeps going. 
Indeed, God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only son of God. And this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. Jesus has not come to condemn the world, but to save the world. Oftentimes this John 3.16 is used as a weapon of the evangelical church. Get your affairs in order and get right with Jesus before you die. But Jesus isn't talking about the afterlife here. He's talking about the here and now today. For those who don't believe are condemned already. The light has come. But the people are in darkness instead of the light. I want to pause here and name an important side note. This text has been used by the white church to support slavery and, condem and to condemn black and brown bodies. This is not what Jesus intended but it has been embedded into our culture. Light is better than dark. White is better than black. Dark is used to describe evil and sadness and pain while white is used to describe purity and holiness. Our own faith tradition has been a part of perpetuating this. And while it seems innocent enough, it creates implicit bias in our brains. We start to think that way that light skin is better and more superior than others. It's ugly. But rather than avoid it or try and kick the snake out of the way, I'm going to do my best as your pastor to lift these things up and name them so that we can start thinking and believing in new ways. All right, let's pivot back to those texts. The problem these Israelites were wrestling with was the sense of hopelessness. They could not trust God that things would ever get better or different. All the Israelites could see was desert, the weird manna they ate every day and the endless wilderness ahead of them. It was getting really hard to trust the invisible being that the promised land was actually gonna show up. The dream was becoming fuzzy and it was getting harder to hold on to. For Nicodemus too, what Jesus was suggesting was too radical to actually happen. A life with God not based on what you brought to the temple or how much Torah you had memorized. A life with God that was not earned, but given as freely as the wind blows. A love that is not based in shame or guilt or condemnation, but by staring at what you are most afraid of. You are liberated from death itself. Pastor Grace Imafu compared this to the superhero Batman. That moody, wealthy human, Bruce Wayne, had no supernatural abilities beyond this simple premise. He chose to put what he most fears, the bat, on his very body. And by this, he became Gotham's greatest superhero. I think Jesus is right. Most of us live in this frozen place of hopelessness where our fear keeps us from being brave or trusting anything other than what we can know or see. It's easier to sit in this place than attempt to do something different. We are the ones who have condemned ourselves. Our fears leave us miserable and bitten. And most days, the ideas of doing something different feels very far off and fuzzy. It's really hard to believe and trust in something we cannot see. But deep down in our gut, we know that our fears are poisoning us from being the people God has intended us to be. When Theo was born, a friend of Mike gave us this book I had never heard of before 
called The Orange Splot by Daniel Magnus Pinkwater. Has anyone heard of it? Okay, good. Keep listening. Mr. It goes like this. Mr. Plumbean lives on a neat street where all the houses are the same. And one day, a seagull dumps a giant can of orange paint on his roof. Hence the orange splot. His neighbors get really upset and they tell Mr. Plumbean he's got to clean it up so they can have a neat street. And Mr. Plumbean says, okay, but he gets different kinds of paint instead. And he ends up painting his whole house in these wild colors, making a beautiful and strange design on the front of his house. And then the creative itch takes him a little further. He plants palm trees and gets a pet alligator for his front yard and a hammock. And he sits there drinking lemonade all day. And the neighbors are flabbergasted and kind of embarrassed. I mean, they used to have this neat street and they desperately want things to go back to the way things were. And so they convince Mr. Plumbean's next door neighbor to go talk some sense into him. And so the neighbor goes over at nighttime and he sits in Mr. Plumbean's front yard all night under those palm trees, drinking lemonade and talking. And Mr. Plumbean tells him, my house is me and I am it. My house is where I like to be. And it looks like all my dreams. This neighbor goes home and the next morning, his house has been transformed into a giant boat. Well, you can guess how the rest of the story goes. The whole neighborhood freaks out and one by one, they all go to visit Mr. Plumbean at night, they drink some of his lemonade and chat with him all night. And by the next morning, their house is also transformed into a hot air balloon or a castle, Parthenon, so on and so on. And when questioned, each of them say, my house is me and I am it. My house is where I like to be. And it looks like all my dreams. You know, I wonder, the only way to get out of this poisonous place of fear in myself is to look at the cross and be reminded that these fears don't get to have a death grip on me anymore. We can indeed trust that God will catch us when we shout we are falling. God has our backs and has promised to love us forever. Worship is this visible place where we get to encounter God where we can be reminded like Mr. Plumbean's neighbors that our deepest dreams are God's dreams, that who we are is enough and that we are not alone in this work of God's abundant life for all creation, even when all we can see is wilderness. The deeper we lift up these fears, the less control they have over us. For today, dear ones, I do not know the snakes that you wrestle with but I invite you to be curious about them. Don't shy away from them, but make them visible. Place them right on the cross and do not be afraid. Maybe even make a cross out of sticky notes on your desk and write them down. Say them out loud. And then read John 3 out loud too. For God has not come to condemn you, but to save you. In fact, the Greek in this text for world is actually cosmos. God has come not to condemn the cosmos, but to save the entire cosmos. For you are who God has created you to be. And that deep longing in your gut that you are afraid to let loose could very well be the Holy Spirit nudging you. Yes, what if? Encouraging you to turn that giant orange splot into something wild and ridiculous and life-giving, not just for you, but your whole neighborhood, and maybe even the whole cosmos. Amen. Thanks be to God.
Jesus, keep me near the cross. There's a precious fountain, free to all a healing stream. Flows from Calvary's mountain, in the cross, in the cross, be my glory till my ransomed soul shall find rest beyond the river. Near the cross a trembling soul, love and mercy found me. There the bright and morning star sheds its beams around me. In the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever, till my ransomed soul shall find rest beyond the river. Near the cross, O Lamb of God, bring its scenes before me. Help me walk from day to day with the shadows o'er me. In the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever, till my ransomed soul shall find rest beyond the river. Near the cross I'll watch and wait, hoping, trusting ever, till I reach the golden strand just beyond the river. In the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever, till my ransomed soul shall find rest beyond the river. Join me in confessing our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. On this fourth Sunday in Lent, let us pray to our loving Father for all the needs of the world, responding to each petition with the words from today's psalm, your mercy endures forever. O oh God, preserving your church through good times and bad, empower pastors, missionaries, young adults in global mission, and all ministries of service for their work throughout this pandemic. Bless Lutherans around the world, our ecumenical partners, and everyone preparing for baptism at Easter. O oh God, our Redeemer, receive our prayers. Your mercy endures forever. Continue your creation of this good earth. Nourish seas and rivers and give water to thirsty lands. Nurture spring growth that feeds hungry creatures and bless the fields being prepared for the growing season. O oh God, our creator, receive our prayers. Your mercy endures forever. Where COVID-19 rages, send healing. Wherever tyranny rules, restore human rights. Wherever there is domestic terrorism, send concord. Wherever there is bloodshed, bring peace. Wherever people starve, 
give food and water. Wherever there is discrimination, inspire all residents to honor one another and to strive for justice. Prosper the work of those who care for the victims of violence and grant legislators wisdom in decision-making. O oh God, our protector, receive our prayers. Your mercy endures forever. As you saved your people of old from snake bite, so now deliver all who suffer from disaster, hunger, disease, and despair. This morning, we lift up before you Amy, John, Marie, Amy, Harlan, Ruthann, Bill, Peggy, Sanada, Levon, Dale, and the Mendenhall family, and those we name in our hearts. God, our Savior, receive our prayers. Your mercy endures forever. Shine light into our darkness. Make night into a blessing. And in mercy, hear the prayers of our hearts. O oh God, our friend, receive our prayers. Your mercy endures forever. To you, O oh God, our only God, we entrust all for whom we pray. Through Jesus Christ, our loving Lord. Amen. At this time, you can unmute as we share the peace. Christ's peace be with you always. And also with you. Peace to you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace to all. Peace to you. Peace. <laughs> <laughs> I'm back on mute. We continue to be grateful. A year in, all of you are sending in your offerings and the way that works for you. I invite you to reflect on that um, and give thanks as we hear an offertory from Diane and Lindy. Let us pray. Merciful God, receive our praise and thanksgiving in the offering of our lives. For in Christ, you uncurl us from ourselves and our sin, setting us free to serve the neighbor, welcome the stranger, and seek joy in the resurrection. 
through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right and salutary that we at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. You call your people to cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast that renewed in the gift of baptism, we may come to the fullness of your grace. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. It's shed for you and for all people for forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. You're invited to unmute as together we pray the Lord's Prayer. God, remember us in your love and teach us to pray. Our Father, Father Mother, Mother of God in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, kingdom come. your will, your will be, done. be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us, forgive us our sins as we forgive, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the, from the time of trial and deliver, and deliver us from, from evil. From the, the kingdom, the, the kingdom, power, the power, glory, and the glory yours. are yours. And forever. And forever. Now and forever. Amen. 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 Jesus draws the whole world to himself. So come to this meal and be fed. At this time, you're invited to partake in the meal. If you're with others, feed one another. If you are alone, hear these words of promise for you. For the body of Christ is given for you and the blood of Christ is shed for you. Let us eat. May this meal of Christ strengthen you and give you peace until we meet again. Amen. Let us sing together our post-communion prayer.
from it. No. So I saw Dennis just put in the chat that it's Ruth Ann's birthday today. And Thelma also turned 90 um, this month. So it's some fun Zion birthdays this month. I like to use. Yeah. Um, I also have a fun note that I wanted to share real quick from Linda Thompson. We all remember Linda. So she says, hello to everyone at Zion. Thank you for lovely cards and letters you've sent me. What a surprise. I've not been doing much or going back to my senior site program. I sure miss everybody there and at church. I exercise on my stationary bike and walk indoors and do needlepoint in my spare time. While there sure is a lot of. Watching I Love Lucy is my favorite thing to do. I love that. I'm reading a card, yeah. I sure hope and pray that things will go back to normal soon. I got my two vaccines, so that's a start. Mm. You are all in my thoughts and prayers with blessings in Christ, Linda. Um, yay, I thought that was, it was really fun to get that at the church. So um, just some quick notes about what's happening around the church these days. This Wednesday, if you aren't doing anything, stop by our courtyard at six and grab a hand pie from Butter Bakery. We'll have a few fire pits out, I'm doing a little nod to the Lindale community dinner. Um, obviously stay home if you don't feel well and bring a mask and all those good things, but um, that'll be a fun time. Um, we have a couple more weeks of Lent, so you can join us for worship on Wednesdays at noon. We're doing different prayer practices. Um, and you can stick around for lunch after if you'd like. Today is the last day of our soup fundraiser. So I'll put that link in the chat box for one more, one more day. If you want to stock up your freezer, just make sure to use that promo code Zion. We've raised almost $400 through that, which I think we can almost buy a farm for with the ELCA Good Gifts. So that's pretty exciting. Um, let's see. There is a survey that just went out from our vision team. If you haven't received it yet, either by email or paper, please let me know. But the vision team would love your feedback. Um, we've been reflecting on the last year and we, we want to know where you all are at too. So please take five minutes to fill that out. We really appreciate it. Um, and families, you can each do your own. Um, so let me know if you have any questions on that. Also, Holy Week is coming. Holy Week is coming. So um, the 28th is Palm Sunday. And instead of meeting here, I'm inviting you to drive by church. You can get your palm and we'll have a communion station. You stay in your car and just show up at church sometime between 9 and 11. And we will bless your palms and send you back on your way. We will record a worship service that you can watch on YouTube um, at your convenience. Um, so that's our plan for Palm Sunday. That's March 28th. Uh, there will be no like Monday, Thursday or Good Friday service. We still have that um, Way to the Cross Good Friday service that you can watch on YouTube. And then um, we're also doing a prayer practice instead with uh, Sister Michelle Waka. So that'll premiere live at noon on Wednesday of that week, but it'll also be recorded. So if you would like to participate in something a little different this year, let me know. I just need to get you an art kit, um, but it's free. We got a grant to do it. So uh, I will put the link for that in the chat box as well, or you can call the office and let me know that you'd like to do that. Um, let's see. And then Easter, we'll be back here on Zoom, but Allison and I and a few others will be in the sanctuary live streaming. So if you would like to purchase a flower for the sanctuary, please let the office know that you can get a lily or a mum or daisies, which you could replant. So um, those orders will be due not this week, but next week. So think about it. Let us know if you'd like a flower to represent you in the sanctuary this year. All right, what am I missing? Anything? Uh, a few of you have asked about Dale's family. Um, so Dale will be privately interned in Mora and the funeral has been postponed until we can gather together. So we'll do that for Dale and for Nidra and for Karen, probably at the end of the summer or early fall. So that's the plan. Yeah. Any announcements? We got council this week. 
those are public meetings. So if you want to join us, just let me know. I'll send you the Zoom link. No snacks, though. And today is pie day. So eat some pie today. That's important. All right. Well, no other blessings. Please stick around if you're able for a virtual coffee hour. And we will have book club at 1115 in a breakout room. So receive this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace. In the name of our creator, son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Peace. Christ is with you. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.